Globally, we now consume 4 billion tons of oil every year. Oil spills from shipping accidents and offshore blowouts are rare, but when they happen, the impact on the environment, on livelihoods, and on the local economy can be severe. In this series, we'll be asking the key questions. What issues do we need to consider? What expertise and techniques are available? And how do we deliver a well-planned and executed response to minimize impact? The moment a spill is reported, it's important to assess the nature and scale of the problem. And very often, the best way to do that is to get airborne. In this programme, we're going to be looking at aerial surveillance, how it can help us assess a situation and get the information we need to guide our response. Once spilled at sea, most oils spread rapidly over the surface. To begin with, they form a continuous slick, but then the wind breaks the slick up into fragments. Therefore, surveying spills from a vessel isn't actually ideal because it's very difficult to get to grips with the full extent of the problem. ITOF has been responding to spills since the 1970s and knows that the key to a successful response is fast and accurate information. Often that's best obtained through aerial surveillance. Aerial surveillance is one of the most versatile tools that we actually have available to us in oil spill response. An aircraft can quickly get us to the location of a spill, so we can make a fairly rapid assessment of the extent of contamination and also start to try and identify some resources that might potentially be at risk. But there's little point getting to a spill if you can't get expert eyes on the scene. It's important that each surveillance flight generates information that's both reliable and actually useful. And the key to that is making sure that you have an experienced observer on board every single flight. Expert interpretation really is critical because it's not simple. For example, it's sometimes hard to tell if what you're looking at is even oil in the first place. Have a look at this. It looks like an oil slick, but it's not. It's just two different masses of water side by side. They just happen to be different colours. And this one, it's stirred up sediment, that's all. Now this looks like oil coming ashore, but it's just floating algae. This looks like a bit of sunken oil, but it's just seaweed. And what we're looking at here is seagrass beds. So the point here is that spotting and quantifying an oil spill may sound easy, but that's because people expect to see large slicks like they see on the news. The reality is actually far more tricky. It's not always easy to spot oil at sea. And one reason for this is because oil actually is subject to a number of different natural processes when it's at sea, which collectively we call weathering. And as the oil weathers with time, it actually changes its appearance. So you really need training, but crucially experienced, to know what it is you're looking at. Most oil spread rapidly, sometimes covering hundreds of kilometers of the sea's surface. Continuous slicks are usually formed first, but currents, turbulence and the wind tend to break them up into fragments. Crude oils and heavy fuel oils can also commonly mix with water to form an emulsion, giving them a browny orange colour and a cohesive appearance. Emulsified oil is often found in layers that are centimetres thick. So it's all about getting experienced observers on the scene to assess the situation. And one of the first things to consider is which aircraft to use. The manoeuvrability of helicopters is an advantage for surveying complex coastlines, cliffs and coves. For spills further offshore, fixed wing aircraft are faster and have a greater range. 
Whichever aircraft you go for, good all-round visibility is essential along with suitable navigational aids. These are crucial for estimating large slicks, particularly offshore where there are no reference points. But once you've chosen the aircraft, it's not just a question of hopping in and setting off. There are many things to consider. And if you want to gather useful information, then detailed preparation is essential. Charts of the affected areas are useful in order to help plan the route while taking into account any restricted airspace. And it's important to consider altitude. On a clear day, 1,000 to 1,500 feet is ideal for spotting oil, while 500 feet is suitable for getting a closer look along shorelines. A safety briefing is also essential. Forecasts of the current location of the slick and the direction it's heading in are also very valuable in planning a systematic flight route. The movement of oil depends on two key factors, wind and currents. So knowing this, we can make some basic initial forecasts on the trajectory of the oil, using the rules of thumb that oil travels at about 3% of the wind speed and at 100% of the surface current. Where available, sophisticated oil spill modelling programmes can factor in a wide range of complex variables and provide predictions about the trajectory and fate of the oil to help guide the response. Although these predictions are useful, they are still predictions, and even sophisticated modelling has its limitations. So it is usually important to actually get up in the air and do a systematic search for oil over an area of sea to find its actual location. A ladder search pattern is a particularly effective method for surveying an area. As a swift assessment is critical, it's often the aircraft which are most readily available on site that are used for surveillance. But if possible, using aircraft fitted with specialist sensing equipment can provide valuable additional information about the extent and distribution of oil. I'm meeting with someone who's conducted aerial surveillance of oil spills on many occasions. Alex Hunt from ITOF. Hi Alex, good to see you. Hello. This is a very rugged looking aircraft. What have we got here? It is. Um, this is a Dornier 228 and this one's been specially adapted for aerial surveillance. Why this aircraft? Well, first of all, it's twin engine, yeah. so it's safer for offshore flying. It's got a good range. Um, it can fly for around five hours. It's also got a high wing, as you can see. So that means that all the windows on the aircraft here have a really good view ah, of the sea surface, course, so you can yeah. see the oil on the sea surface. But in addition to that, you have um, some specially adapted features. So this window here, um, convex window, means that some of the observers can get a really good look out um, at the sea surface at the oil. Also, you have some cameras um, mounted on the aircraft. So first of all, you've got this turret-mounted camera down here, um, which has a you know, visual camera and an infrared camera. And that's all in that kind of grey ball That's all built, there. built into that piece of kit there, yes. Wow. And this all feeds back to, to someone sort of monitoring it on board? That's right. And it also can be fed to the command centre as well to assist the response. Very good. Mm. Anything else? Yes, um, there's actually three fixed cameras just under the nose here. Got you. Um, it's a big old nose, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> there's, um, there's a visual camera and there's an infrared camera and an ultraviolet camera. Wow. And they all assist the observers to assess where the oil is. It's a very high-tech aircraft then. It is, it's, it's one of the more specialised aircraft that are available, yes. Very yeah. good. Shall we have a look inside? Absolutely, yeah, let's go. It's not just the exterior of the aircraft that's been optimised for aerial surveillance. I see, so all the seats are stripped out. Just yeah, a few here. to minimise the weight. Oh, very good. And uh, what, we've got headsets? Yeah, well, these are really important because um, uh, the cabin can be extremely noisy. So the observers can discuss what they're seeing and uh, discuss any changes in the flight plan that might occur. If, for example, you find oil where you didn't expect to or you have to search a wider area to find the oil uh, because it's not where it's supposed to be. And sometimes we might see things that we, um, we need to get a closer look at. And so we might need to speak to the pilot about flying at a lower altitude and making another pass. Mm. So it's really important to have that constant sort of easy communication with each other. At the back there, we've got lots of technical stuff. That's where the feed comes through from the cameras we were looking at. That's there right. There's, there's an operator um, operating those. And during the flight, also, there'd be a computer here that, so, that, so that the observers can monitor what, what, what the operator's seeing as well. Yeah, All right. it's really geared up for this job. Time to get strapped in, I guess. Safety first. When it comes to oil spill reconnaissance, this is about the most sophisticated aircraft we could hope to get our hands on. 
But with most spills, time is a critical factor and responders need to get airborne as soon as possible in order to identify threatened resources and guide an effective response. For all the high-tech equipment at our disposal, it's still just a tool. In high-pressure situations, it's the skill and experience of the observer that really counts. So Alex, obviously there's no oil down there today, uh, but what would you be looking for on a flight like this? Once we found the oil, we'd be recording information about its location, um, the area of coverage, so the overall extent, and its appearance. And the appearance of the oil can give us an indication of how thick um, the layers are, and that can tell us a little bit about how much uh, volume uh, of oil there is at sea. How tricky is this whole process? It can be very tricky indeed. Um, you know, the oil's never really a uniform slick on the surface. It tends to spread out and break up and fragment um, with the wind and the currents and the turbulence from waves. Um, you could have fog, for instance, low cloud, which make the visibility so poor that you simply can't see the oil. If you've got really strong um, winds and high waves, um, if you're dealing with a really viscous oil, like heavy fuel oil or, or, or heavy crude, then it can be overwashed by the waves and partially submerged. And so you wouldn't see the slicks on the surface. They're actually pushed down below the surface of the water. Um, there's been past spills where we haven't realized that the oil's in that area until it actually comes ashore, because there's no way of seeing it. Even in good conditions, it's almost impossible to estimate the thickness of oil to a high degree of accuracy. Slicks of black oil can range from as thin as human hair to tens of centimetres. So you could be looking at hundreds or even thousands of tonnes of oil for every square kilometre. That's why surveyors on the ground can provide important data to complement that obtained from aerial surveillance. By contrast, reasonably reliable estimates of thickness can be made based on the colour of sheens. Metallic sheens, iridescent sheens and silver sheens can mean the difference between 100 and 50,000 litres of oil per square kilometre. Nevertheless, it's the thicker slicks and patches that present the greatest threat, so it's important to prioritise these. Once you know which direction it's likely to be moving in, based on the wind and currents, you can estimate what resources are at risk along the coastline and uh, perhaps guide the response towards protecting those sensitive resources a little bit. This aircraft is very well equipped. Do all the aircraft you use have to be as sort of technologically advanced as this? Well, yeah, indeed, it is a very well equipped aircraft. In many situations where we don't have um, access to aircraft like this, and some countries they, they simply don't have the resources available, so we um, take advantage of whatever aircraft we can, we can use. Um, it needs to be fit for the job. The various remote sensing devices work by detecting different properties of the sea surface, such as colour, reflectance, temperature or roughness, all of which can be altered by floating oil. Overall, how important is it to get up here like this we're doing today and actually get a view of the oil from, from above? Well, it's, it's extremely important, I think, in, in, in many cases. Um, it's the only way, really, to get the very good quality information about um, the resources at risk and, um, and to guide the response. Aerial surveillance guides the response by locating the oil and confirming its behaviour, by directing vessels and aircraft towards the largest slicks, the thickest patches and those that present the greatest threat, and finally, by tracking the progress of the response operation. The information collected from the aerial survey should be relayed to the command centre as quickly as possible to aid decision making. A Geographic Information System, or GIS, enables accurate geo-reference data, environmental sensitivities and response resources to be overlaid, which aids planning. Subsequent flights, ideally with the same observer, provide a picture of how the situation is evolving. As the response progresses, the need for aerial surveillance diminishes. Well, there's no doubt the bird's eye view is pretty valuable, but there's another tool at our disposal that we haven't mentioned, and that's satellites. Here at the headquarters of the European Maritime Safety Agency in Lisbon, the Maritime Support Centre provides satellite images to coast guards in 27 countries. 
This display shows all the vessel movement in European waters and can provide valuable information in the event of a spill. One of the most effective methods for monitoring oil spills is via satellite using SAR. SAR is synthetic aperture radar and it's a type of sensor which is on a satellite which is orbiting high up in the sky about 800 kilometres. Um, it's producing pictures of the sea surface using microwave radar. So you get this wide area of view that can work day and night and it can work in all kinds of weather conditions. Oil on the water dampens the sea surface. SAR can detect flatter areas of water and highlight potential spills. But as other factors could provide false positives, these alerts need to be corroborated. Verifying what we detect on, this, on the SAR images, verifying the possible oil spill um, is important and we do this by the support of aerial uh, surveillance patrols from the Coast Guards from the different countries. The MSS aims to relay alerts as quickly as possible. In 2009, a satellite over the Atlantic to the south of Ireland captured these suspicious images. As soon as the images came in to us here in Lisbon, uh, we created an oil pollution alert report which was sent out to both the Irish and UK Coast Guard. Um, the alert report was on their desks pretty much within 30 minutes after the satellite flew over, so it was a very fast response. When the Coast Guard arrived on the scene, they discovered this spill of several hundred tonnes of bunker oil. The speed with which the authorities received the satellite imagery and reacted meant that the spill could be effectively dealt with. Whenever there's a spill, the decision makers need detailed and accurate information about the extent and the location of the oil. Now, you can't beat aerial surveillance for getting that information fast, but for all the sophisticated equipment and techniques available, you have to remember it's the interpretive skills of the observers that really make the difference. And for more details on any of the issues in this series, have a look at the ITOF technical information papers at itof.com forward slash tips.